Oh, that makes it yeah, good night. Okay, uh, thank you for coming along tonight to the Antenna and Analyzer Forum. Um, apologies for the uh, slight um, adjustment to uh, our viewing pleasure, um, <laughs> to get our viewing pleasure right, but um, uh, we've, uh, we've now got things all connected up so that they are um, uh, all connected together, so we get all sorts of things. So. We may have a little bit of uh, adjustment as we go through. Um, what th this comes from our other forums that we held um, over probably the last well, one to two years, where we've had people come along and bring their uh, their various items that we were the forum was based on, and we found that there was some great feedback around those forums. Um, people. Uh, got to learn about what other amateurs were, were doing um, and and who was doing them so that they could then go and talk to them. So um, what we thought about here was uh, an antenna and analyzer forum. Um, the, the format is very much bring along your antennas that you're using, your an antenna analyzers that you're using and share your your experience of those antennas and those analyzers so that people can, uh, can uh, number one, see them uh, either on the screen um, or in, in uh, actual, um, actual equipment. Um, and what we're going to do at the end of this is come up with a, a matrix of um, the antenna and the analyzer <laughs> and the amateur and some comments and we're going to share that amongst members so that if they if they want to know about a, a 23 centimeter um, Yagi design and how to build it um, they go and see um, Rex, Richard, myself or probably any number of the other 50 other people that have built them <laughs> so, um, so, so um, that, that's the idea of this uh, as a bit of a, um, a sharing uh, forum. You can go into it as much depth as you want, uh, or you can um, just say, I use this antenna, this is my experience with the antenna, etc. So, uh, so that's the sort of forum, uh, the format of the, uh, the evening. Um, I do have a, a PC here, so if you've got something on a USB stick, we can plug it in and you can show people. Um, so, uh, so yeah, without further ado, who would, uh, Who'd like to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I'll step up because I might, oh. because I might <clears throat> come up to the front of the line. Do you have uh, network on that as well? Oh yeah, well I'm sure. Yeah. Um, uh, and also, um, we we are streaming this and we are going out on um, uh, RF. So uh, I'll keep a bit of an eye on uh, on uh, the YouTube comments that will be coming through, and we'll go from uh, go from there. But I so you um, your desktop and your how do I clear this to get to the thumb drive? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, just escape would probably be a good start. That's excellent. And then go to File Manager. This is Light Linux. Oh, here we go. Um, Okay. Mouse is quick. Yep. Yeah, and up to the top, second from the top. Cool. And it's DB, DATV image. Yep. Uh, there we go. All right, so um, my name is Paul, I'm VK7FPCL, uh, and um, after casting them out with a lot of different things, running up a uh, a random wire in my backyard and doing a bit of research I settled on because um, I have a little bit of land uh, a uh, 40 meter delta loop uh, and so what I ended up doing is getting a, um, a 12 meter um, 12 meter squid pole uh, and um, what I have here, uh, how many people know about uh, 40 meter delta loops? I mean, it's, I, I can't talk too authoritatively about it, uh, even though I have one up. But it's 11 meter at the apex and 17 meters at either, um, at either side. And then that, that horizontal is suspended two meters off 
uh, off, off the ground there. Um, I had a lot of problems in the beginning. Uh, it was permanently fixed at the top. Uh, and so since that's flexible uh, above this point, which are the guys, uh, and Tasmania being what it is with winds, um, had a nice, after about a year, had a nice break in the, in the antenna wire up at this point. So what I've done is I've attached carabiners with um, uh, uh, zip ties at this point, and then this one, which I'll explain in a, in a little bit, so that I can now lower that with uh, some line if I want to get to that and, and, and replace it. This one over here is just a, a, a bit of a sloping 10 meter dipole that goes to another part of the house that goes in the uh, uh, garage. So you'll see in the next picture, if it shows it, um, I don't know if any of this, what I thought we got, I would get the most out of this besides presenting to you is that, you know, later on going to you guys and saying, you've seen it now, tell me what I can do better. <laughs> But uh, this is a bit of C-section uh, from an old fence uh, that I've concreted into the ground and then the mast fits into there nicely with some padding around it to keep it stable and some strapping around it. The picture is a bit fuzzy. This is one of the um, uh, supports for the horizontal on either side and I have it running through a uh, a bit of uh, uh, plastic PVC so that it keeps it level and doesn't rub too much. And then over here is a, uh, a six meter piece of um, uh, standard, uh, 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 what is it, uh, 75 ohm coax as a, uh, as a ballon, as a load to some uh, proper uh, coax going back into the shack and I forget what I used, but it wasn't cheap, so it must be good. Uh, so, um, so that runs back across the yard. It's not a flat run, so it goes kind of over a brick wall uh, and then down into the garden and back and up into my garage window. Uh, and there's a, a, a couple and a join and a piece of um, MDF, and the window slides close on that, and then. I have uh, some patch sleeves going uh, to my rig in there. I put this up over here because that's the join and I'm constantly kicking it uh, and a, a bit worried about that. So uh, I got the 40 meter uh, delta plans off the net. If you look that up, you'll see some pretty standard and recurring plans for uh, 40 meter uh, delta loops. and. Um, they're all pretty much the same, but I believe this one is, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because I forget things, horizontally polarized if it's, if it's two and a half <coughs> meters from this point here. Uh, so right about there, the pictures aren't that great, right about, let's see, is that the one? Yeah, right about there, there you go, there's that blotch there where uh, I, I tie in with the, um, um, What's it called? The um, standard 75 ohm coax. It's RG59. Uh, yeah, so it's just a six meter length of 59. And so that ties in there. I had a really nice arrangement where I had taken a bit of uh, chopping board and put a nice bulkhead mount on it and things like that. But that ended up fretting in the wind over time. And so I had to repair that. And I replaced all this, uh, replaced the whole tenant just recently after about a year, because what did I use? I used that um, standard uh, amber color uh, two-core speaker wire you get from Bunnings, if you're familiar with it, and that lasted a year, but this is now some, uh, some good heavy gauge uh, um, coated uh, tin wire that I got uh, here at the club. So this, Let's just see, I'm going to close this because I don't know which it will flow on to. So, um, I've got a, f I have an antenna analyzer, um, a rig expert. Uh, it's um, an AA35 zoom. So, it's 
just good enough for uh, the lower hand bands, nothing that some of the more advanced and adventurous people would get into. And let me just see if I can pick these out here. Well, I'll show the worst first. This is the 10 meter dipole. There's definitely something wrong with it. <laughs> uh, so, so we have our SRWR on the side here, not looking so hot. Uh, so, um, no. It's not 10 meters. <laughs> well, that's true too. Uh, I mean, it's cut, but it isn't. <coughs> um, so, what I have here is, this is what the rig expert tells me for my my delta loop. So it's not um, it's not the, the best, I guess. Um, actual figures: what do we have here? One point seven nine at seven point one. Uh, megahertz and then 2.73 at 7.2 uh, so um, and also is within tuning range I guess of 10 but you guys can tell me whether or not I'm I'm dreaming yeah so with the with the um, with the Yesu, with the inbuilt tuner, I reckon I can do either of those. Uh, and then uh, this is a little bit more detail. Um, for the uh, uh, for, for forty and. Then a little bit more detail for 10. Is that 10? That doesn't look right. That look more 15, 15, 15. Yeah, sorry. Uh, now, I guess I must have deleted. I didn't want to uh, bore people with too much in the way of graphs from the rig expert, so I must have taken the wrong one out, but it would, it would reflect what we saw in the, in the uh, wideband uh, pass that it did. So that's pretty much me. I have um, a few other antennas, uh, uh, NFEDs that Ben, uh, uh, I purchased from, from Ben, and uh, a couple of other bits and pieces, uh, a, a design that uh, Justin built for, uh, for Soda that uh, I think is really only tuned to one uh, uh, to one frequency. And I have a, uh, I took it back in the car because uh, I have a nice little um, 10 and 40 QRP um, guys, um, uh, QRP and antenna that wraps up nice on a printed circuit board and things like that. But there's something wrong with my, um, uh, with my my uh, toroid winding on that one, and it's not quite as <laughs> as good as it as it can be. So, so that's that's me for a 40 meter delta. And I would say that if you have the room and the height, um, uh, it's not that it's not that ambitious for anyone uh, to put in the backyard. 17 meters uh, by 12 is all you need, and then the only other challenge is, is all the staking for the uh, for your anchor points. And then your and then your your uh, guys, I guess, of course. But I'm a bit fortunate that I have a little bit of room uh, in my backyard. Thanks very much. Um, any questions? Yeah, um, your rig expert. Um, uh, what's your experience with that? How easy is it to use? I think it's very easy if I can dive into it. You know, from when um, from when I first got it, I was uh, fairly inexperienced. I'm now only slightly worse than I was when I started. So, uh, so yeah, I find it really easy. Uh, I'd say uh, the one, the one, only bad experience I had with it was somehow I don't know how it happened because I don't, I don't think even in my uh, ineptitude would be silly enough to hook it up and transmit into it. But I went to use it one day and <coughs> it failed all of its self tests, and uh, so I sent it back uh, to the to the people I bought it from, and he said, yep, yep, yeah, yeah, you blew such and such, and uh, you must have transmitted into it. And uh, I thought, oh, okay. 
maybe one day I wasn't paying attention and was tired and rushing and uh, and did that. But I I don't know. I mean, that seems a pretty uh, a pretty elementary mistake, but anybody can make them. So that isn't really a bad experience. Uh, the good experience with this is if you send it away and $120 later, you got it back and it was fixed and it worked. And uh, it's a heck of a lot easier to use than the um, What's the little ones we all bought? Um, the nano VNAs, which, which, which you'll show. And look, I mean, if 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 you have the time and effort, I mean, in the eyesight, uh, um, I was getting reasonably comparable uh, 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 readings between between the two. I don't think it's if I if I had seen if I had found the nano VNA before I had found the rig expert. I'd probably still be on the nano DNA. Uh, there was another one that I got, um, and I should have brought that along because I have the nano DNA and <coughs> uh, an, another uh, SWR uh, device um, off of eBay, um, and that one that, that was a bit hopeless. But uh, I'm I'm really pleased with this. Also, what comes with something like the Rig Expert is the comfort of knowing that. It's a professionally designed bit of kit. Um, you know that it's definitely supposed to give you the readings, you know, uh, uh, that you're getting from your gear, be it good or bad. And there's no question in there as to whether or not uh, this this piece of equipment you bought off of eBay is at fault or whether uh, the calibration of it is is a problem. So there's. For, for a newbie like me at the time and, and a little bit now, it's, it's a comfort in knowing, well, what I get here is, 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 a, is a source of truth, as they say. Okay. okay. Anything else? Is that good? Thanks, Paul. No worries. Thank you. Who would like to go next? Okay. Okay, Ben. No problem. Uh, we've got um, Tim VK5ZT and Ian VK5ZD uh, watching on the stream. So they've uh, called in on the chat channel. So encourage yeah, people to call in on the chat channel if they want simple antennas that were cheap and cheerful to build. Uh, that they largely came about because I was getting lazy. So you know, I, I, there were a couple of ideas behind this, these antennas. Uh, one was that ideally they'd be multi-band and no churn. Uh, and the other was from a, that they could be built with readily available parts and of course um, as cheap as possible. So the, the first one I'm going to talk about is the NPEN half-wave antenna. Uh, again, this sort of has come from my experience doing parks, parks activations, and well, not quite so, but mostly parks. And although I, I, everyone tends to use a linked dipole for that, it's a bright pain in the butt if you want to be changing band, bands regularly. Uh, so I, I wanted something where I, didn't, I could just change the band on my radio without having to pull the antenna down, remove the links, put it back up again, scan around, find I should have stayed on the other band. And, do it all again. So I came across a website by, v, I think it was VK3IL, uh, or, or, or VK3IL, uh, talking about the uh, NPEN half-wave antenna. 
Um, it's very simple in design. There's only sort of a couple of components, a, a, a eight to one urna, uh, with a toroid and a capa compensating capacitor. Uh, and with that, there is, it uses the feed line in as the counterpoise, although th there's no reason why you couldn't actually add, add a counterpoise onto the earth <coughs> yourself. Um, so I had a bit of a, a play around with one of these. Uh, I brought the prototype along, uh, pass around, just so everyone can take a bit of a look inside, and put it all together. It was the first real thing I've, I've done with uh, toroids and mountains and windings. Um, so that was a bit nervy for me, because you know, everything had to be just right. But I was really surprised when it, it, it worked. Um, so at, at the time when I was testing it, I had a uh, B, uh, one of the antenna analyzers by VK5JST, uh, which was just giving you a SWR rating, and I'd, I'd scan the bands and, and every band, yeah, we, we my got few is handing up there, <laughs> holding up there now, and everything was sort of under an SWR of two, which is for me good enough when you're out portable and want to achieve a no tune antenna. Um, so sort of between the, um, that that first prototype that's been going around the room. I got a hold of a Mini 600 antenna analyzer um, off our, our, our favourite site, AliExpress, at the time. Um, they're, they're sort of they are Arduino-based um, antenna analyzers, and it, it was sent me back about 250-ish dollars, I think, to have it landed here. It, it came in two days from uh, through to Dubai. Uh, using DHL, oh. um, so that, that, that was pretty good at the time. And the important things for me was that it would allow me to do a, a sweep of the bands uh, and, and scan multiple SWR or multiple frequencies. So I'll pass that around for the hell of it as well. So uh, we're going to scroll this down. How do I delete your configuration out of this menu? Yeah, I prefer you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, mucking around with the prototype at home at night, um, th there were a, a lot, lot of things to, that were affecting the SWR. Um, a, as you can see here in this picture, it, it wasn't fantastic, but you, you could certainly see how um, you're, you were getting some, some sort of resonance on 40, 20, um, 15 and probably not so much up at 10. Again, that for me, 10 metres and 15 metres, I don't really worry too much about out, the, out when I'm operating portable QRP. I'm more interested in 20 and 40. Um, so I actually started fiddling around a bit more with it at that point. Um, and some of the things which I discovered, and I would like to experiment more, so I should mention in the prototype, you'll see the resistor. That resistor is there to provide a load, um, because uh, with an NPN antenna, you're looking anywhere between with an impedance between 3,000 ohms and 5,000 ohms. It's actually quite a big difference, which is why you have that like eight to one uno in there to bring that down. So ideally, it, this is. This, this is what we're sort of looking at getting. Um, so you're getting your almost, you know, one to one, that down at seven megahertz. It sort of evens out as it goes through 20, and and then uh, slowly rises again um, as it approaches uh, uh, 10 the 10 meter band. And th that, that was, again, just with that um, loading resistor, and that, that was the way I checked, go, OK, at least the UNO works. Um, going down. A bit more. I don't know how well this will come out. So this is when I actually started mucking around with uh, uh, different things with, with the end fed. Uh, one was changing the, the types of wiring use. So uh, the the, the wire that, that comes comes with the kits <coughs> is just the standard AWG22, um, which I'm sure everyone has seen before as that hookup wire. Uh, and then the other thing I started playing with was a 
are still great. So th this is um, a picture hanging wire, basically, which you go and buy at Bunnings. It's relatively cheap. And they actually have a significant difference. Uh, so I find that on, I don't think you can see the grey that well. Oh, sorry. So the, okay, so the blue is the steel, the steel grey. And as you can see, it has a significantly lower SWR compared to the AWG22. And the the bottom line here, which stays up pretty low, is that, that baseline resistor, uh, calibrated resistor loading. So the future home stuff's like steel wire. Sorry? The, the steel wire yeah, is yeah, like it's just copper. Yeah, straight steel wire. Um, not the best sort of stuff to have out in the field because it tangles, it gets knots, it kinks. Um, it's, it, it's a pain in the ass to use, basically. Uh, but, but, but it was fine, fine for experimenting at home. Um, I don't know if I have one more graph here on that page. I do. So, marking around even more, I'm like, okay, so usually I've got a little half metre piece of coax for the, for the counterpoise. Um, so, what, what happens if I add a lot more of a counterpoise? So, I had some 25 metres of LMR 195 kicking around in a coil. So I went and added that to it. Um, the blue is the RG58, which is all the way over there. Which is the four metre one? Uh, the four metre length. And the red, which is this one here, is with the LMR 195, of which there's 25 metres. And that actually made everything pr pretty much usable across the band. So that Again, using the measure of is the SWR less than two to one? Um, yes, it was any anywhere in the best case, anywhere between six point seven and seven point three megs. Uh, yeah, the thirteen point eight through to fourteen point eight, twenty one to twenty two, and twenty eight point nine through to thirty. Um, so, just by a little bit of mucking around and using, um, yeah, and and using different wires, you can have a great difference in what you're doing with your end-fed antenna. Um, certainly one of the things I tell people when, when they get the kit um, is consider using a, a thicker, like an AWG-18, AWG-19 <coughs> wire, right? um, if, if they want better multi-band performance. Um, so yeah, that, that's a, my little story about uh, using the end-fed for a working HF. It works really well. Uh, I know Murray has used the Uno kit up here on a 160 metre end fed that, that um, if you look outside, it covers basically the entire ground, I think, <laughs> doesn't it? And the reports there are very good. So, I mean, the, the biggest thing with end feds is that you measure the length of the wire. It has to be a half wave, as the name suggests, of, of the lowest band that you want to work. Um, so if you wanted to have a, a something suitable for 80 metres, then your wire length is going to be, antenna wire length is going to be about 40 metres in length. I'd just like to say though, when you're using this portable, yep. the end, if you're just stringing it from the ground up, yep. you can't have that ballon on or close to the ground, Definitely. because the SWR just goes... And that's, that's, that's low definitely low. Yeah, one of the things yeah. Unlike your dipole, where you can sort of drip the pins almost onto the ground. Yeah. Got so, I mean, yeah, when, when, when I'm out by bar, I usually try and find something to hang it off, even if it's you know, a tree branch a metre off the ground. Um, so, the other antenna which I've, I've brought along uh, was my cheap and cheerful way to get into working satellites. So, this is a VHF UHF Moxon. Again, this is a little bit of a prototype version. Um, because I was doing some testing, again, cheap and cheerful, uh, with, with readily available parts, mostly from Buddings. Um, so, obviously you get the boom, as just a length from Buddings. Um, one of the, the fun things is, you can't really get um, clips for, th for the three millimeter antenna. They tend to only go down to four mil. So, in this prototype, I've actually used just electrical tape to add a bit of space. Uh, around the elements to clip down onto. Uh, plenty of hot glue. The brass attachments onto the aluminium here 
uh, out of uh, terminal blocks, uh, just electrical terminal blocks, and the aluminium is 3mm uh, TIG welding aluminium. So I'll pass that around again. Um, so again, uh, there's not really much to say about it. It's it's pretty sensitive to um, uh, to tuning, uh, but you're, you're mainly looking at, at the parasitic element, which is above the moxon component. There, for your 70 centimeters, um, you, you'll see the uh, wall plugs, the green wall plugs on the moxon there. If you adjust that that air gap distance between the elements, that has a significant uh, difference on SWR. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, I've plugged my little T90 handheld into that, um, getting beautiful signals off um, the Fox 1A, Fox 1B satellites as they pass over. Um, the only thing is, I I do that at half duplex uh, because I, I've only got the one handheld. Um, I've also placed a mobile phone holder at the bottom because I. Uh, there's an app you can get for your iPhone that actually allows you to work out the elevation and bearing that you need to point the antenna at. So, uh, as the satellite goes overhead, you can use the app and you can just point up and rotate around and go for it, really. Um, of both these kits, again, I, I wanted to make, I want to actually sat down, I've written up instructions, I've even got all, all the parts and components to. Uh, provide these as kits to people uh, because I wanted to be able to uh, supply cheap, re ready to go kits for foundation licensees uh, to get on air without there being a great expense and uh, again ha being able to have all the bits they need just there re ready to go rather than trying to source them which can certainly be difficult to do when you're first starting out. So yeah, that, that's my two cheap, cheap and cheerful antennas. Questions for Ben? No, no. Fantastic. Excellent, thank you. Who would like to go next? Martin. Yeah, you're ahead. I, I thought we should let the younger members of our thing see what an antenna analyzer used to look like. <laughs> Is that the pocket version? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, this is not all you need. This is just the bridge. You also need a signal generator and an RF meter. So that you can measure the, you know, we're trying to get R plus or minus JX. We can measure the R and we can measure the X. Sorry, the long, wrong way around. Measure the R, measure the, measure the X. And then, of course, we can plot it all out, which is what we used to do. One point at a time. Oh. On something like a Smith chart. Oh. Ever seen a Smith chart? You've probably heard of them. That's what a Smith chart looks like. And you would sit there and you'd make your measurement and put a point on there. And you'd make a measurement at another point and another point until you'd got enough to show where it was going and where the 50 ohm point was and so on. It was very exciting in those days. Bored you to, to, to bits. But of course, things always progress and move along. Then we got a noise bridge. How many of you have seen a noise bridge? Good. Wonderful device. If you look at the knobs on it, what you have to do is zero the noise in your receiver. So you have a receiver connected to here, and your antenna or whatever it is you're measuring connected to there, and then you minimize the noise in the receiver, and that will give you the uh, plus or minus JX. But I can tell you, you have to be very, very, very sensitive if you want to get an accurate reading out of it. Uh, things moved along and we actually got some things that started to look like, this is still analogue, 
it still tunes a capacitor when you turn the knob around and it measures SWR. So plug your antenna in there, turn it on, pick the band, tune and look for the SWR. So that was quite good fun. And along the way I should add that uh, one of the things you, you needed, I'll show you a picture later of a big quad going up, but if you want to measure the, and tune the resonance of a big quad or the delta loop, what was the delta loop, or the delta loops, you can use a, a grid dip oscillator. And you make this into the shape of a like a coat hanger, and that sits on the wire of the quad, that goes to the GDO, and you tune the GDO, this thing on the receiver, because no GDO has got any calibrated work, calibration worth a damn, but it does work. And back in the day, that was all we had. And then came some magic boxes. This is what I call a magic box. That's uh, an HF one, I think. Little digital device, very similar to the antenna analyzers we've been looking at before. I don't know whether it's got any power on it. No, this one probably has. Yes, that one has. This is a VHF one. Uh, you can tune around and it will give you the impedance and the SWR and the frequency. So it's a magical box. And that you can carry up to the top of a tower. That you can't. <laughs> now, of course, we, we moved along even from there. And we got to what we've seen already, the, the antenna analyzer. And these things are like magic. And for somebody who started with that, I can tell you, this is magic. <laughs> <laughs> because if we turn it on, we'll find a bit of garbage. Instead of sitting there and plotting point after point, from that onto a Smith chart. If I want to draw a Smith chart, I merely hook things up. I'll show you when I've got that to go in there. And we go to Smith chart, up, 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 Smith chart. Okay. And we ask it to draw a Smith chart. <laughs> and it draws a Smith chart. <laughs> and you go. Oh shit, they used to take me half a day. <laughs> I'm redundant. <laughs> but it is brilliant. It is really, really brilliant. And if you want to know your R plus, plus or minus JX, it'll do that for you too. So we cancel that one and we go to the RX chart. Okay. And it shows you what's doing over frequency. I won't go into too much detail. You can actually get it to read out the resistance in ohms and the plus or minus J, X, so you know your capacitance and inductance. And I have used that on a, a, a short vertical, which I've got. I better not call it a short vertical, have I? It's about 75 foot high, <laughs> which I'm using on 160 meters. It's got top loading, and when I tune it up, it's about resonant 2.5, something like that. But with this, I could get the R plus minus JX, which said, all right, if I put an inductance in there and a capacitance in there, it should tune. It didn't, as Linda will tell you, but <laughs> that was not the problem. They were, the components were correct. It was a different problem. Uh, if I get a USB dongle, can you That. I just remind people that we've got the chat channel live and uh, you can uh, ask some questions around that. Okay. Cool. Yeah. There's only some pictures on there, so it's not a problem. Okay. Now, quite recently, Linda and I were travelling with our caravan on the mainland and when all this COVID stuff blew up, we decided we'd better get home in a hurry. So on the way we stopped in at Strictly Ham and I couldn't resist buying a, a 9700 Icon. Sunday morning and I thought well, I'd better contribute my bit to it. So I did what every good plagiarist does, I 
slip through all the books I've got till I found something that would operate on 1.2 gigs. And most of them were like that sort of antenna over there. Uh, lots of work, lots of cutting bits of that metal and so on. And I thought, well, if I go in a hurry, there's got to be something else. And I looked and looked and looked and I found this in the AARRL antenna book. And it's called a patch antenna. And this thing is so simple. It's 100, 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters, at least 150 by 150, 10 millimeters separ separation, a bolt in the middle, and a, a connector feeding through from the back plane to the patch. And that's it. So I put this thing up, and lo and behold, I'm working everybody around, around Hobart. I'm thinking, that's ridiculous. Well, but it does do that. So I constructed a few of these, which is when you've got 70 foot and 80 foot verticals, you know, waving a quarter wave vertical around like this is sort of fun, really. <laughs> um, but I was able to pop that t them together to measure the gain of this thing. And the gain of this thing is, on my measurement, about 7 dB over a dipole. Uh, I looked up on the on the net and found a lot of the theoretical stuff on the net. And the theory for this shape is that it would be about 9 dB isotropic. So I'm not far off. 7 dB dipole, 9 dB isotropic, they're not far off equivalent. So it does 7 dB, and the other advantage of it is, for use in what, what I'm using it for, is that it's quite a wide bandwidth. But the disadvantage of the, the high gain uh, Yagi is that it gets narrower and narrower and narrower the more gain you pop, it, pop into it. Especially when you have a six meter one. Hey, uh, Richard. Uh, and, well, one of the things you can do with this, because I can't make a six meter one, but if you want to go up one band, all you do is you add, add another panel on here and, you just keep and feed that through. Another thing you can do is that that's where 50 ohms is, that's 200 ohms or that's 100 ohms. Now if you've got 100 ohms and you parallel to two of them together, you're starting to talk some real gain and it's still 50 ohms. And if you put four of them together, there's actually a picture with about 100 of them together, but they're smaller ones for 10 gigs or something. But you can, you can easily stack them. So it's, they're, they're an interesting antenna. I've never encountered them until I I read about them in the AWR antenna book, I looked it up on the net, found a whole stack of information. And you're probably, a lot of you have probably got them in your uh, mobile phones because they're used extensively in mobile phone technology. They're also used extensively as a feed in a dish system where they have a circular one and get circular polarization out of it. That's the other thing with this, by the way. That's horizontal polarization. That's vertical polarization. Simple. Okay, let me show you some pictures. Linda insisted I put this up so you will know who does all the real work <laughs> when we're erecting antennas. <laughs> and I wanted that to be, um, that shows a quad where I was using that coat hanger thing to uh, to adjust it. How do I? Now, I, I think you just go down, just push the down button here. Um, That's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is that so that's a, it's just a sideways on for the same picture. That's. Uh, that's about a 60 foot tower when it's cranked out. Uh, now this is the other antenna I wanted to talk about. This is the Ultra Beam. You may have read about these. Uh, has anybody else got one? Okay. Ah. This particular one is two elements on 10 and 40. Uh, 10 megs and 7 megs. Uh, three elements on 14 up to 28 and six elements on 50 max. And when you go, look at it, uh, see it better here. These little black boxes are motors. And there is like a, a steel tape measure and it's made of brilliant copper. It goes out and round the tubes. And so when you, when I switch a transceiver to seven max, the little 
it switches a relay to say just use those two elements and then it sends this tape all the way around the tube until it matches one to one SWR. And it, it does it because if you tune from say 7.05 to 7.0, it retunes. So you're at one to one the whole time. Now, I mean, there are problems to this. One is that it's quite heavy. And the other one is that if you get a lightning strike, says yes. <laughs> you see, this is where my, my winch operator comes in. <laughs> Oops. What happened, Justin? There should be another one. Well, that's the beginning. This one shows a few things. First of all, you can see again how this big loop is what gets the low bands. This is the 20 meter element. Um, somewhat embarrassing when I uh, put it up the first time, I hadn't calibrated something or other. And in the ends here, there's, there's a little bit of foam to stop the insects getting in the end of the tube, which is pretty clever. But because I hadn't calibrated it, went up there, and the little um, brilliant copper strips came out the end of the thing and knocked the foam bits out. Now, what is really magic is you look at this country here, and I actually found both of them. <laughs> both of the bits that have fallen on the floor. Um, this also shows something I've done over the years with bigger and heavier towers is to use this form, so it goes to the top of there, down along the tower, then up again over a pulley and down to the winch. That way you've got mechanical advantage first, you've also got a lot of support on the top of the tower, which is suffering a lot from having this hanging off the end of it. Um, I've had some fairly big beams, I've had, I suppose the biggest would have been the five elements on 20, which had a boom like that. And it was a log periodic. Log periodic nearly killed us, didn't it? Yeah? <laughs> nearly killed us. We had a big log periodic. Uh, Don't have I can't even remember, remember how many elements it was. But <laughs> this was back in South Australia, and it was uh, on the end of a tower like that. And I was stood up, sort of getting it all mounted onto the end of the thing. And Linda's stopping it, going sideways. And it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. <laughs> it wasn't good, that one. We did get it up in the end. Um, so that's essentially the, the Ultra Tune. And um, I've had it up there since January. And it worked pretty good. Uh, it does work very well. As I said, the risk is that you've got these lumps of motor up in the air there, which if any, you know, not a direct hit, I mean any antenna disappears with a direct hit, but even a close hit will probably affect the motors. Um, but I've got it so it cranks down. We've had it down once already because uh, the rotator got got, uh, got a problem. Replace that and it's, it's now going okay again. Um, it hears very well out there because the noise floor at my remote station out north of New Norfolk is like somewhere short of zero. There's almost no noise at all other than any natural noise that's <laughs> occurring <basically> static. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it, uh, I worked a guy on 10 megahertz night before last, um, or the afternoon before last, and uh, he sent me an ecstatic email because he was running four watts. So I was able to hear his four watts and he was struggling to hear my <coughs> yeah. 120 watts. <laughs> uh, so those are the toys, and thanks for listening. Thank, Thank you. you. Any questions for Martin? Yeah, quick question, Martin. <coughs> yeah, what size cable have you got supporting, you know, lifting up your uh, tower, like the one going over the two pulleys and coming back? Um, 
it's it's what what I would have called <laughs> called a quarter quarter inch. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what they do mil. that in millimeters. Five, five mil. Five mil. Yeah. yeah. Five it does job quite happily. Yeah. yeah, it's fun. Five mils yeah. cool. Okay on that. Um, I've had bigger ones. If you go to the the bigger winch, which you saw on the first one that mm -hmm. Linda was running, that one has uh, eight or ten mil. So are those towers guide as well? When you're up? That one. That one's only got guys from a, it doesn't need to be guided, it's freestanding, but I've got guys on it just as a stabilizer. Yeah, it's just just in case. I mean, it's on top of a ridge, yeah. and the winds come straight down the, the Duant Valley. Um, it gets a fair old pounding, so it's got that. Heaven alone knows how the fiberglass and stuff in the antenna will survive, but we'll see. I haven't been up there since we had the winds the other night. So. The <laughs> that was that was about as strong as I think I needed to go for for big antennas. Any other questions? Sorry. No. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Who's next? Oh. Uh, I'll go next. Steve, VK7 OO, and I have an interest in magnetic loop antennas. Uh, I think my first loop was built probably 10 years ago, and what got me was that it was a um, 2 metre magnetic loop made out of copper pipe, and it was about that square. And I was interested in it because I thought it as a stealth antenna. Um, wasn't successful, I think I managed to get it to work once. But at least it let me know that magnetic loops were not difficult to build, but they were very difficult to use. So, in my employment, I happen to know an amateur in South Australia, VK7, sorry, VK5 SFA Steve, who was my engineering manager, and he built one of these. He designed it, specified it, analysed it correctly, did a lot of work, and uh, proved that it was a antenna that would work on 160 metres, work on 160 and 80 metres. And that particular antenna is two turns and it's three metres across. So it's, it's quite a heavy beast, it's quite a big beast, but it works. And on that antenna I achieved third in the RD in the year that I used it uh, in Australia, first in BK7. A third of my points came from that one antenna. Um, That's it in the corner of my yard. Now that corner is a space of about four metres by four metres. So by the time I guided it, I couldn't actually turn it. So it was, it was where, it, where it was, but it worked quite well. Um, now that's made um, out of half inch heliax. The, uh, the one that Steve built was made out of um, about an inch and a half waveguide, which is a little bit heavier than half inch heliax, but the performance was similar. Happy with that. Um, okay. That's um, when I was tuning it. So I had to set up in the middle of the yard. Uh, quite a beast to build. It took me quite a while to build it and cost quite a bit of money too, so not cheap. Now, this is the um, vacuum variable capacitor that I obtained at the Miana Ham Fest mm. probably three or four years earlier, um, which I hung on to. It came complete with a tone gearbox and a motor. But uh, because of the RF voltage present, I couldn't use the motor in it. So the motor was uh, destroyed and turned into a shaft, and then this plastic pipe went outside the loop to a different tuning device or different motor drive. But that worked really well because this um, little arm here was geared down so that several turns on the magnet on the vacuum variable was a, a half turn on this. So I just had to mount some switches, and I could find the end of the uh, vacuum variable, which worked really well. Now, uh, three years ago, roughly, in AR, uh, Jim Trellis, VK3, Justin, help me. VK5 JST. Was it VK5 JST? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I thought it was VK3. No, I think it was VK5. Okay, anyway. This particular design 
um, and that antenna is for 20 meters, so it's a one meter wide loop made out of plastic pipe. Now the good thing about this plastic pipe is that it has an aluminium layer and it's for gas. That's what it's designed for. And it's kind of flexible, implemented a little bit. Um, but the good thing about it is that the aluminium layer um, is your antenna or your radiator. And you can make an antenna out of it because three quarter inch copper pipe fits in it very nicely. And so for a relatively small price, the cost of a length of that, about $25 or $30, this is running prices by the way, 20 odd dollars for a metre of this, which is quite dear, but for under $50 you can make an antenna, um, to a magnetic loop antenna using a trombone arrangement. Now this particular one, the trombone is inside the PVC pipe, and I've just used half inch heliax as my matching loop. And this shows the mechanism <coughs> without the PVC pipe present. So I've got a motor down the bottom here, um, just a quarter inch threaded rod to go up into this plastic pipe, moves the pipe up and down, that's all it does, and just pulls the trom trombone um, in and out. I think I've got a better picture of that. Steve, is that yeah. copper pipe insulated from the aluminium, is it? Or? Yes, so the, this this is um, what's called PEX. It's um, plastic, aluminium, plastic. I'm not sure what the PEX is. Um, it's the type, of PEX, the type of plastic that it is. You have a plastic layer on the inside. I'll hand this around in a sec, which is trans semi-translucent. Then you have a layer of aluminium. Now I've just hacked this with a knife, so it's really, really rough, but you can see what it's made up of. And then an outer layer, so that when you put your copper pipe inside there, it is insulated from the aluminium. And if you bear about, in this case, about half an inch of aluminium from the end, you prevent arcing over to the piece of copper that you've got inside. So I'll just pass that around. It's a neat bit. So therefore, by moving the trombone in and out, you can tune the, the antenna. Now, our good amateur who's off shore with the VK3, um, okay, work okay, out that... I've looked it up a second. Okay. So he worked out that a length of three quarter inch copper pipe per metre is around about 66 picofarads. Well that's okay, that's pretty cool. So I calculated backwards what I needed. Now I needed 14 picks. So two pieces of pipe effectively in series, so that's half the uh, capacitance. I needed about 200 mil, no, no, 50 mil, that's right, I need 50 mil of um, pipe. But I thought 50 mil of pipe is very short and it's going to be too difficult to tune, so I cut it longitudinally. You can see that I've cut it in half, so I've only got half as much pipe inside the um, PEX, so I could make it 100 mil instead of 50, and that makes it easier to tune. So that was a bit of a brainstorm idea. It also makes it slide in and out easier because it's not just in case the PEX isn't straight. Um, that shows the switches. So one of the switches on the end of the pipe, so that pipe moves up and down, so it's just a matter of mounting switches on the piece of wood. And that all fitted inside a 50 mil uh, PVC tube. So um, there's the motor at the other end. And it just simply drove the shaft, and there was a nut inside the plastic piece at the other end. Um, and that was one of the controllers I used. That one's just a... Um, uh, PWM controller, that little metal box, you can buy off eBay for about six dollars. <coughs> I had to build a couple of relays, a directional switch, and uh, feedback from the switches up on the antenna so that I knew which way it was loose. When I'd reached the ends, it would just turn off, that way you couldn't drive it too hard. Um, and that's a close-up view of the pipe that you buy from Bunnings, which is what that stuff is. Uh, just in case, I had to write, take that photo because I couldn't remember what size it was. Um, Back to the beginning again. That's it. Any questions? So that was a 20 meter version of you. The yellow one? Yeah, 20 meters. Yeah, which is currently running on my slow scan system. And it works. It's not the best antenna in the world, but the advantage of a magnetic loop is it's got a good signal in the moisture ratio. So when you're doing slow, slow scan, that's important. You don't need signal strength, you just need quality signal. Any questions?
questions this time? No. And, that, and that, that yellow stuff is available from Bunnings, is it? Ah, no. No, no they used to stock it and they do not have it anymore. Okay. It disappeared off their website was the first clue I got, so I raced out and bought another roll. And they, now they don't have it. Right. You will have to go to other suppliers. I don't know where. Yeah. I don't know where you can okay. get that. But that's the problem with it. But if you can get it, mm. you know, you're probably have to buy a 50 meter roll or whatever. But they used to sell it in six meter rolls, which was perfect for making a one meter wide loop. Or if so you know a gas fitter, they've probably got spare um, capacity. Yeah. But you need, the, you need you need the 25 mil of that particular stuff yeah. um, because that's what fits the. Uh, that's gas tight, 25 mil. Yeah. Um, you need the inside diameter to be correct. So it fits. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's the cool thing about it. So get that to be not nice and neat fit on the three quarter inch pipe. So you know it's going to be reliable. Good okay. stuff. But nothing worse than having a loose fit because then capacity is going to be able to replace it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yep. Thanks, Steve. That's Thanks. excellent. Um, very impressive antenna. And, and you've got the contest results to uh, prove it. <laughs> yes, yes, because when you're working 160 metres, it's double points. <laughs> or triples if you're in the middle of the night, so yeah, it was good. And just a reminder that it is the RD next weekend. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah. next weekend. Not, not weekend after, sorry, the weekend after this. So, uh, Don't yeah. scare me, I'll have a hatch of antennas we can get to. <laughs> so, uh, good stuff. Who wants to go next? Okay, I will. Um, excuse me, bro. Box of stuff. Um, okay, you've heard referred to um, the. Um, uh, hang on. Okay, can we hand that back to Steve? And actually, can we hand that back to Martin? Um, <laughs> so, um, um, one of the. Um, to um, show you. Okay. Um, we've got a couple of examples of it and Martin, uh, Martin referred to them. Um, the 23 centimetre the 23 centimetre um, uh, Yagi's um, complements of um, Rex and uh, DL6 I did bring this one along because this was literally tuned last night. So it's the youngest Yagi, 23 centimetre Yagi in Tasmania right at the moment. Um, um, it, it's uh, the jigs, Rex has got the jigs for, uh, and, and Richard's got the big jig, I think still for drilling the booms. Um, it's eighth uh, or 3.2 uh, mil uh, aluminium welding rod uh, from Kennedy's. Um, uh, plastic pipe fittings um, and the fiberglass, um, these are fiberglass fence posts, electric fence posts uh, that come in these standard uh, uh, 1.5 metre lengths. Um, uh, literally, and, and it's got the patented, um, no, not patented, but anyway, Rex's uh, <laughs> Rex, special. <laughs> Rex special of a, um, a quarter wavelength um, uh, tube, uh, a conductive tube, uh, to stop the, uh, the the RF going back down the. Um, quarter or half? Is it half? Uh, Mm, no, no, it's be half at half wavelength. Sorry, yeah. 23 centimeters. That'd be 12. Looks like an open circuit. Yeah, so you don't get any anything back down the um, the coax. Um, I think Alan's put a folded dipole on yes. this. Um, so folded dipole um, or normal dipole. Um, the design uh, for those who don't know, VK5DJ uh, has a Yagi design uh, program. Uh, you put in the parameters of the boom and the and the um, elements etc etc and it just gives you all of these wonderful measurements it also gives you some wonderful things like if it knows the booms 10 mil uh, it gives you the measurement uh, on each element uh, so you can put a line on it and then just line it up and put the aerodite on it uh, and you know that it's in the center of the element <laughs> so it's really nice that particular program um, so um, now uh, HF link dipoles. Um, 
Ben, um, ben, I think, referred to these. Yeah. Um, for This is what I use for soda. People have probably seen these. Um, uh, normal dipole. Um, they, I have to thank Warren here for putting me on to these wonderful little... Um, uh, the Radio Control Fraternity use these uh, these little connectors, which are basically a little gold um, gold plated sleeve and a little spring arrangement that enables you to uh, make a connection or not. Um, I originally had alligator clips on here; they rust, so um, so I, played, I changed over to these little um, power connectors, RC power connectors, and um, it uh, it works wonders. Um, it's RG174 on the coax. The reason for that is weight, so you don't have as much weight in your pack. Um, that's a that's actually my son Ruben's um, uh, foundation license one. That's a four band foundation license one. Um, so it, it covers the the 80, 40, uh, 15, and 10 um, with normal coax. And just take take note when you <laughs> I hand this round. The difference in weight of using just RG58 with RG174, <laughs> um, it's worth going to the RG174. Um, now, and if you, you want information, um, I have actually, uh, there's a, a spreadsheet that's at, that is on this uh, web page that enables you to put in all the frequencies and it gives you the link lengths. Um, to start with, so that's why I gave that. Um, now, some people would have known um, um, VK7JJ um, came up with a, a wonderful design uh, for a vertical uh, that he he designed um, that has it centre loaded. So there is a little um, little bit of PVC uh, that centre loads um, this particular uh, antenna. Um, and uh, you put it on a squid pole, in fact the squid pole is still in the car, um, and um, put out a few, uh, four radials for your ground plane, and the only thing you need to do is, if, if you're on 20 metres, um, you need a little, there's a little loading coil um, that you can put in here, um, sorry I'll put them around the right way, they're colour coded, um, um, and it's got a little trimmer uh, capacitor on it to get uh, to get your uh, get it tuned for 20 meters, and also for 80 meters. Similar, and it's just a um, it's a little uh, matching transformer. Um, but literally, that's that's all the antenna is with a squid pole. Uh, you don't need um, you don't need a tuner um, for the other bands. And if you put these in for 20 and 80, you don't need a tuner either. Um, so um, that's JJ's design. It would be very remiss of me not to bring along a G5RV. Ah. <laughs> so this is a G5RV uh, in a bag. Uh, I use the 450 ohm um, um, uh, balance line, um, and I also <laughs> use um, the the um, the Acrobat. Um, this is a um, Tentec. Um, Acrobat, which is really easy to use for either 450 ohm or 300 ohm line up to your dipole. It's got a hanger so you can actually hang it up, up for, off of a tree. Um, and this is the portable one. I've got all the rope and everything that goes on there. So, so the G5RB, for those who don't know, is uh, 102 um, foot. Yep. 102 foot, so 51 feet aside. Um, and it tunes uh, from uh, 80 through to 10 um, with a, you need an ATU um, to, to tune, but uh, uh, well worth a look if, you, if you've got the space for a 102 foot dipole. Um, now, 630 metre Marconi T. Now, that this yeah. No, I took this five years ago. <laughs> we didn't get snow in South Hobart. However, five years ago, Facebook's a wonderful thing, comes up and says, Do you realise five years ago this happened? And I went, That's what we're expecting tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, 
Um, and there's all houses over here now. Um, <laughs> that's what, that's amazing what five that. years does. Um, Marconi T, uh, for those who don't know, is just a vertical, a top-loaded vertical. That's all it is. Um, lots of, uh, I've got four going in either direction. Those go in either direction for about eight or nine metres in either direction. And then this is about 10 metres in height. So there's just a vertical. It goes down to an, an NDB um, uh, antenna matching unit, which is X Antarctic Division. <laughs> um, 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 and uh, I use that and, and there is, the backyard is basically um, lots of wire, so there needs an excellent ground. Um, so on 630 metres I've calculated that to be, and actually measured it, it's about 1% efficient. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if I want to get my 5 watts of EIRP out of, out of my antenna, I've got to put 500 watts in. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Why there's no snow? What are you currently putting in? <laughs> I'm putting in nothing. It's the receiver only antenna. <laughs> but anyway, I, I do have a 500 watt, 630 meter PA that I'm actually building <laughs> right at the moment. Um, um, but uh, anyway, that's that's the Mark T, and that's actually one end of the other G5RV that I've got um, got in at the backyard. Um, the other one I just wanted to very quickly mention, um, I played with satellites for a little while. I haven't been for a while, but I used, I built two 70 centimetre, what they call linden blads. Now, uh, if you go to the airport, you will see these antennas because they are really low angle antennas. It is four phased um, folded dipoles. The way that you get them to, to match is there is a bit of 300 ohm line that comes down that are all equal lengths and come down to a point in this um, bit of PVC tube where you connect to the, uh, the coax and you, 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 you match all of those very carefully. Um, you'll notice that one's in one direction and one's in the other direction so you've got a left hand circular polarised and a right hand circular polarised. They both come down to a coax relay, which you can't really see here, but the coax relay is there that I can switch between them. So um, I can switch between left and right hand circular polarised. Um, very effective. Question, Justin, what's the vertical bit? What's this bit? It's no, just no, 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 on the antenna itself, the vertical bit. What looks like a portaway? The, the, the folded dipole here. No, no, no. no, no that's that's another folded dipole. No, no, no. The other no, dipole. No, 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 yeah. yeah. Sorry. There's a the vertical section to it. The better yeah. portaway. No, no, it's not. It's edge on. No, no. angle of the photo. It's the angle of the photo. What what you've got is four four dipoles at forty five degrees that are ninety degrees to each other. Oh, so where that what looks like a vertical one is just. It's just the angle. It's just the angle you're looking at. It. One of the men don't. Yeah, yeah. Well, the other the other one's got the same thing. Yeah. It? yeah. Okay. So, um, so that uh, uh, Linda Blads um, uh, worth worth a look if you're into that. Um, very quickly, um, um, Martin mentioned mentioned, and in fact, uh, they brought along. No, <laughs> well, this is. Oh, that's Steve's. That's mine, yeah. So, so this is the same thing, um, looking a bit dusty, but this has, um, I, I wrote an article for AR Magazine which um, extended the range downwards for 630 metres and for 2200 metres. So there are two, and unfortunately I think it's come adrift because it's rattling, um, but <laughs> anyway, um, there are two rather large inductors in there for those two, uh, two bands. When I started playing the 630 metres, I needed something to go downwards. This only goes down to 1.3 megs. So there's some additional inductors in there and uh, I put in AR Magazine how you actually do the modifications to it. So uh, that's the JST um, uh, antenna analyzer. Um, you would have seen, uh, and Martin had an MFJ. This is an MFJ single band, so this is for 70 centimetres. So this is um, uh, a UHF antenna analyzer. It actually covers a bit more than 70 centimetres. It's like 400 to almost 500. Um, so literally you just plug in the antenna and you tune it to the frequency you want and it's reading the SWR. That's, um, that's the MFJ. Um, it would be very remiss of me not to bring along the Nano VNA. Um, this is um, 
when uh, when we bought this, and I've featured this on the DOTV nights a few nights. Um, uh, this is just uh, for what it costs. <laughs> it's just a remarkable little box. Um, I do actually have this. Only goes. This is the original one. So this is the original one that produced. That only goes to 900 megs. I have ordered um, the Nano VNA H, which is the 1.5. It goes to 1.5 gigs. Um, so that's on its way. But uh, anyway, you're welcome to. Hang on, I'll switch it on. Um, touch screen. Uh, your Smith chart. It'll mm. plot on a Smith chart if you want it to plot uh, on a Smith chart. Um, it, it's got the calibration kit in there um, that, that came with it, um, but I just, if you want to get into antenna a analyzing, cheap, you can't go past it. The only thing is, you need magnifiers on, uh, you, you've probably got too fat of fingers to push the buttons, <laughs> but, but anyway, it's, it's, you, you get used to using it. And the only thing I've got uh, as an experience, using it outside, if there's any sun, forget it. You've got to, you've got to get into a, you know, little, little cover to, to use it. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Okay, who's next? Anybody else? <coughs> I didn't uh, bring it along because I've forgotten the fact that I actually had it tucked away. Not being on air at the moment, uh, things have got put in the cupboard. Uh, but uh, apart from the Ortec analyzers, VHF and HF, which I warn people, if you do happen to come across one, they have a habit of uh, having uh, crooks over joints inside, and that's happened to one of mine. So I've uh, got to open it up and do some surgery. Uh, but they're just a, a little basic thing that you can put in your pocket, and uh, it falls on the ground. Uh, sorry, but uh, it's just a plastic case. Um, I've also got uh, the earlier uh, grid dip, uh, grid and pieces and so on. I've got. Uh, a VNA, uh, one of the earlier models, uh, and yet to put that into uh, use, uh, but uh, it looks to be a handy bit of kit. You don't get any instructions as such with it, uh, not from my source, so you've got to go looking for that for them. <coughs> but I've also got a Comet 600 analyzer, and that's a, a bigger beast. Uh, comes in a pouch. Uh, you can run uh, rechargeable batteries or external supply or uh, dry cells in it, uh, but it, it's a little bit smaller than a MFJ analyzer, but it overcomes all the problems of uh, the MFJs and uh, it doesn't carry any faults with it. Um, it uh, gives a, a nice little uh, readout on the screen. Uh, same as all the, the new ones, uh, but uh, uh, as I say, it's you don't put it in your pocket, you've got to carry it in the pouch. It'll be twice the size of the Rig Expert, and probably twice, maybe three times the weight. But it's certainly uh, uh, HF, VHF, UHF usable. To the, is it 630 meters? ZAP used to play around with all that low frequency oh, stuff. It what was even lower. Happened, what happened to all that gear? Oh, did that get thrown completely? Or was 630 meters? He was lower down. He was lower, much lower. He was 137. 137. So yeah, yeah, yeah. One, 137 was his scientific license. Um, lots of that went to Bob Warren actually, oh. and I, I, I assume he's got that in um, South Australia. So, no, just yeah. for interest sake, so a few years ago, there was a guy called VK7 ZA Bill, yep. who used to do a lot of this experimenting, and he was an eccentric guy, totally deaf, but he built a lot of this gear, it was like in Pickle. You know, Correct. Absolutely unbelievable. And we used to go and help him out all kinds of places, he'd want to go and test this stuff, so we'd end up 
in all kinds of places. Yeah. He was a, a pioneer in that. In, in the, I've the, got some very good photos of that guy. Yeah, okay. In the archives, if you want to remember. Cool. So, yeah, a real pioneer. Cool. Thanks, Ken. Anything else? So what we'll do out of tonight is um, I'll go through and get the matrix that I was talking about earlier together um, and uh, we'll distribute that to, to members um, so that uh, with, a, with who was involved and, and that sort of thing um, so that if you've got any follow-up questions for people uh, then um, by all means uh, you can get in contact with them and ask them more questions or designs or, uh, or that sort of thing so so um, so and you're welcome to uh, have a look um, grab a, a coffee or something and, and have a look at what's what's uh, on the tables and ask questions so uh, um, we got uh, we don't I don't have any more questions on the chat channel I'll just put out a call um, to see this is VK7 uh, OTC just uh, putting the call out for uh, anybody who's watching via the streaming or the uh, RF uh, for uh, any questions for uh, any of our presenters tonight uh, on the Antenna and Analyzer Forum. Uh, over. This is VK7 OTC just putting out a call for any questions or comments uh, on the uh, Antenna Forum that uh, has been streamed uh, on the Reese YouTube channel. Uh, over. Yeah, I've the problem with the stream <laughs> is I paused it and we still, I'm actually still streaming Steve's part of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't actually got to the, if the and the um, the chat actually comes up in chronological order when you stream. So if you're not at the end, you might not you might have missed some questions. Uh, anyway, um, that's all right. Uh, so that, no, that's fine. Um, uh, so yeah, grab a grab a coffee and we'll uh, and have a have a bit of a look and a, a play. So uh, thanks for coming along. So, I'm <laughs> 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 <la